it's hard to believe it's we're only in our second day. It's like we're in the second month. But uh, it's really been a, a, a tremendous uh, conference so far, and I'm glad that all of you have had the opportunity to share this with us. Um, tonight, today, what we're going to talk about is a little bit of the intersection between technology uh, and society, really. And so uh, we're very pleased to have uh, with you um, folks from BTO and, of course, Alta Charrell, who you already met earlier today. So um, let me make some introductions. My name is Jeff Ling. I'm the director of the Biological Technologies Office. Um, sitting here to my left is Dr. Doug Weber. Uh, Doug is a bioengineer by training. Uh, we stole him from um, the University of Pittsburgh, where he's a tenured associate professor. Uh, and he is uh, going to talk to you a little bit about some of his programs. Uh, over here, I have Dr. Justin Sanchez, also a tenured associate professor out of uh, University of Miami. Uh, he is a legitimate uh, neuroscientist, and we will, uh, he will talk to you about some of his programs. And of course, all of you have already met Professor Altacharo, uh, attorney and ethicist, uh, who is, uh, gave just a really an extraordinary uh, talk earlier today. Uh, she's actually going to be our commenter on some of the programs and some of the things that we need to be thinking about, this time not in the genetics world, but rather in the space of brain science. So uh, we're really pleased to have her. And, and she's done a lot of these things already, but one of the things that didn't come out earlier today was she actually served on President Clinton's uh, bioethics committee uh, back in the day. And so it's really uh, wonderful that she's thought about these things at a very high level, and now is going to help us with these. So what we're going to do here is we're going to it's going to look good. We're hoping it's going to be, we're trying something new. So this is DARPA, whatever. So, okay. And so if it's DARPA, we have to have Star Trek, okay? So that's just the way it is. So what we're going to do here is we're going to bring up some of the topics. We're going to actually use Star Trek uh, clips to give us an introduction to the thing that we're going to want to talk about. And then I'm going to actually ask the program managers to discuss their programs as they pertain uh, to the science uh, as we see it. And then, of course, as Hollywood sees it. And will let um, Alta kind of navigate, help us navigate through all of that. And then later on, what we would like really is to have the audience participate. And so if you have some interesting questions that you want to pose uh, that pop up during this, please use your app. Uh, we have some folks monitoring the apps that are going to um, uh, call out some of these questions. And then certainly, if you're not shy, stand up uh, at, towards the end there, and we will uh, hopefully we'll have time to answer some uh, questions uh, directly. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, we are DARPA, and DARPA, of course, is a technology agency. That's what we do. And, but as we do that, we're doing it in the context, just not in isolation of the Department of Defense, which is really our primary constituency, but we're doing it in the context of society at large. And the thing about technology and society, it allows us to actually push capabilities forward, but in doing so, there's always a double-edged sword. So to help us navigate that, uh, as we talk about this, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Char uh, Alta Charo to go ahead and step in and help us kick this off. Okay. First, thanks very much. I'm sure you guys came here for Star Trek and not for any of us, but we appreciate your attendance. Uh, uh, the, I think one of the most important things to remember is that technology does not develop in a vacuum, except perhaps on the space station. Uh, it develops against the backdrop of public sentiment, which is formed in, term, in turn by a lot of things, including popular entertainment and how it portrays science and scientists. So one of our challenges is to deal with the fact that pop culture often leaps way ahead of where the science really is. Sometimes for dramatic purposes, it leaps to those things that are the most destructive. Uh, I happened to go to Jurassic Park this summer. We were just talking about that earlier. And once again, it shows that genetic engineering inevitably leads to mass destruction, death, and the end of the ecosystem as we know it. And pe but seriously, people leave there with their fears of genetic engineering reinforced by movies like that. And yet we need to understand that popular culture in order to understand where the public's attitudes are coming from and then use it somehow to move ourselves back to something that's a little more grounded in reality and discuss the ethics and the policy implications with that knowledge in mind about how people may be hearing what we're talking about, even when we talk about the real thing. So while we're going to move on to some of the pop culture, I think uh, I'm going to turn to Jeff to start us off with what's actually real before we get to what is fiction. So, so to talk about what is actually real, happening today, obviously what we're going to do is talk about some DARPA programs. And so 
conceptually, we know that technology helps us in many ways to perhaps alter the environment. But there's another environment that we can alter, and that's the environment of ourselves. And so one of the areas that, uh, in, in DARPA that we're exploring is the ability for us to use technology to work with the peripheral nervous system. That is, the nerves and the cell bodies that exist outside of your brain and your spinal cord. The nerves in your arms and your legs, the nerves that innervate your organs. And can we, can we intercede at that level, outside the brain and the spinal cord, into those nerves, so that we can then have impact on where those nerves go to? And typically, we think those nerves are only going to go to muscles, but that's not true. They also go to the organs. So can we? through the peripheral nervous system, develop technology that allows us to self-regulate a lot of the normal bodily functions, uh, such as heart rate, respiratory rate, digestion, and the like. It opens a brand new field. And the pioneer of this field, the, the, the person who's actually leading us down that pathway, is my good friend, Dr. Doug Weber. And Doug <laughs> is going to talk to you about his new program called Electrix. Thank you, Jeff. That's, uh, those are some very flattering remarks. I never really considered myself to be a pioneer, uh, certainly in this field, but uh, that's kind of you to say. So the electrics program is, is indeed very exciting, and it's, it's brand new. We're just kicking it off um, at the beginning of next month. And our goal is uh, twofold. First, we want to advance our understanding of the neurophysiology, of uh, health physiology. That is, we want to understand how the nervous system contributes to our body's regulation of many functions, cardiac, immune, uh, metabolic, and so on. And then use that knowledge of how the nervous system works in monitoring and controlling those functions to advance technology that allows us to use devices rather than drugs to treat disease. Essentially, what we want to do is use the, the nervous system to uh, restore health, essentially leveraging or enabling the body to heal itself. OK, so that's the concept. Leverage the, the natural functions of the body uh, supported with technology that we're creating to serve that specific purpose. This is not an, ent an entirely new concept, however. Uh, there's a large medical device industry that's been developed over the last uh, several decades uh, using that, that same sort of core principle, using devices to modulate internal uh, uh, neuro neurophysiological functions. The limit, uh, there, there's several limits of those uh, existing devices, however. First, they're very blunt, okay, so they lack any precision to uh, precisely target specific pathways in the nervous system, and that leads to problems with uh, uh, major side effects um, and uh, limitations to um, uh, responses to treatment. As well, the, the technology itself is, is very big and bulky. Okay, so it requires open surgery to implant uh, the, the devices that are needed to provide treatment. Okay, so wouldn't it be great if, in, if instead we had minimally invasive technologies, stuff that could be injected uh, directly to the site of uh, activation to provide uh, essentially surgery-free uh, treatment for those diseases. Okay, so in the program we're going to first expand our uh, knowledge of how the nervous system uh, provides those functions and then second, develop technology that enables us to do, uh, provide those treatments in a non-invasive way. Well, that's, that's, that's terrific. Thank you. I think I, I want to underscore a little bit of what Doug is talking about. This is, we talk about natural healing, the body's ability to heal itself. You know, when you, when you break a bone, for example, the orthopedic surgeon puts you in a cast, and the ba bone basically knits itself. That's what happens. Uh, when a surgeon, uh, after a laceration, throws a couple of stitches into you, it's not the stitches that heal you. It's the apposition of the two uh, edges of the tissue, and the tissue heals itself. So conceptually, what Doug is doing here uh, through his program is finding ways that we can direct the body to heal itself. We're talking about obviating the need for surgery, obviating the need for medicines, obviating the need for certain kinds of other types of therapies, so the body can heal itself. It's really, truly a revolutionary approach. It is the ability to voluntarily or at will turn body systems on or off, up or down, to accelerate them, let's say when you're running or doing a sport S activity, slow it down when you need to rest and, and, and recover your metabolics. These applications are obvious to us from a beneficial health approach. 
they are obvious to those who serve in uniform how they can be used. A, uh, a forward operator, for example, running to a, uh, to a location, dropping down, and then instead of constantly trying to slow his or her heart rate down, they can do it through our technology. Slow their heart rate down, slow the shaking down of their hands, get on target, do their mission, get up, turn it back up again, and get out of town. So this is all voluntary. So we can see the very positive things that can happen here. And then there are other positive things, such as you twist your knee. Any of us have done that, skiing, uh, playing golf, uh, walking, right? And the ability to turn down the inflammatory system, for example, turn up the self-healing system, for example. These are the things that Doug is referring to. Sounds great, doesn't it? But always, there's a double-edged sword. Always, there's two sides of a coin. And always, there's something that more than meets the eye. So I'm going to ask Alta to take it from here. <laughs> Well, first, I've got to say I absolutely love this idea of taking the body and making it function even better than it does. Um, but if you look at what happens when this idea is translated into the world of fiction, where people get their instincts, it quickly becomes a debate about the difference between treatment and enhancement. Since you're certainly taking a natural capacity and you're now exaggerating it, uh, it can be understood as simply part of the human spectrum or it can be understood as an enhancement. I mean, for example, many people here may have had cataract surgery and you had a lens implanted where suddenly you had the option for lenses that were for nearsightedness, farsightedness, bifocal. There were options for you that would take you far beyond what your ordinary eyesight ever was even before you had the cataract, right? We don't think of that as problematic and yet it certainly is part of that line with enhancement. So um, what we wanted to do was first start with a, a clip from Star Trek that touches on this. Uh, it, it involves Dr. Julian Bashir on Deep Space Nine. When he was a child, apparently he was very slow, not developmentally delayed, but slow. And his parents were not happy about this. So despite the fact that in this universe, genetic engineering is absolutely illegal, even criminal, absent the most extreme uh, disease-oriented problems, they took him to a planet where he was genetically engineered, and they decided, why not, since we're already in there, not just make him average, make him as good as humans can be, right? With extremely good reflexes and a very high level of intelligence. Well, at the moment this clip begins, it's all kind of come to light. And because genetic engineering is such a problem in this universe, he's about to lose his job. Can we have the first clip? So in this clip, you see somebody going to jail for the terrible crime of having treated his child and then deciding to make the treatment result in a child who was as good as he can be within what we understand to be normal human limits. And the reaction is that we need a firewall against it because it's going to lead to eugenics wars and a caste system of people who belong in category A, B, and C, as somebody said during the uh, meet the speaker over lunch. And maybe you think that fear is overwrought, or maybe you think that this really is uh, what we have to do, regardless of whether there's some benefit. Let me show you one more clip that takes it the next step. I mean, after all, if you're going to be in there doing something, why not go beyond human capacity? Why is it that we have to recreate what humans can do? Why not give them kinds of powers that don't exist? So in our next clip, we're going to meet Geordi. Geordi LaForge is the engineer on the, Star Trek, on the uh, Starship Enterprise. And he was born blind. So he has been wearing a visor since he was a youngster, which gives him the ability to perceive the environment. But he perceives it in spectra that go beyond those that are available to us. He sees into the infrared, he sees into the ultraviolet, he can even see sound, so to speak. And so let's have a look for the moment now at exactly how the world looks to somebody like Geordi. Second clip. So we now see what happens when you can use a prosthetic device not just to replicate human capacities, but why not make them more extensive, right? No, oh, well, thank you, Ulta. The that clip, uh, both clips, actually uh, bring up some very uh, interesting um, uh, discussion points. You know, I was a, a physician in uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan, served six tours. And I can tell you that as a physician, uh, I can think of many situations that I would have liked to have done for Julian, what his parents did, and 
for Jordy what his parents did. And in fact, I've actually talked to um, two of my patients, both who have uh, who lost uh, vision because of injuries in the war, that what would it be like if I could just give them the ability to see at the level of night optical uh, vision goggles, generation one, <clears throat> gen one, and they would take it in a heartbeat. They would take it in a heartbeat. But what we see here is once you start to do that, once you have the capacity to be able to give that kind of sensory input in or that kind of augmentation of cognitive back to what we think is not even normal state because we're restoring it, but once you're able to do that, there is becomes the possibility to give even more. Right? If you can, if you can gin up an injured brain to think at the level of an uninjured brain, then it goes to follow that you should be able to gin up a normal brain to think even beyond that. Or perhaps in this case of Jordy, it is not a small stretch to think that we would be able to give the appropriate signaling into the visual cortex to see in the visual spectra, but then again in the non-visual spectra, to be able to see in the near IR, to see in the UV, to see in the electromagnetic spectrum that MTO spends a lot of time and effort for us to see it using devices, that you could actually do that. And would your brain be able to see that? Would your brain be able to see what they try to portray in Star Trek? And I will tell you that they, you would. Absolutely you would. Your brain would adapt to it. They would see it. They would overlay it. And for Geordi, the what he saw was very much that. It's what he perceives. It's what he sees. And so it's not unusual. So when I look out and I see the color blue, Jordy may see something else, but it will be blue. It's what he has defined as blue. So in, with patients, I often say, is put your hands up here. I put your fingers up. Are, you, are, are there fingers up? And the answer is, oh, of course there are. Why? Because I told you so, but you don't see them. But this area is not black. You just don't perceive it. Similarly, if you had a disease that constricted your vision, you wouldn't be able to see your hands. They're not black. You just don't see them. But if you could see them, you would perceive them. And you would use that information. And it would become your new environment. Is that bad? Is that good? Alta. I think we're getting very close to the time where we're going to have to have some reactions from our program managers and from the audience because I also am truly asking the question, is it so bad? I mean, Julian Bashir became a particularly good doctor, and I got to tell you, in other episodes, Jordy saves the ship several times because of what he can see that nobody else can see. Uh, so we can see some of the benefits of these things. Uh, now, I do understand that this does invoke some fear, and in fact, there's a whole world of people talking about transhumanism. For some, it's a betrayal of the nature of humanity, and for others, it's an aspiration for where we should go next in directing our own evolution. Um, so I, I'm curious, since you're the one who apparently is the founder of this entire <laughs> dilemma, what your reactions might be to some of the clips or some of the thoughts here? Um, as the founder of this, uh, of this new revolution, <laughs> I will say um, with great authority that, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not, not being serious, but you know, transhumanism is, is a construct of, of science fiction, right? You know, it, it's, it's, in, it's really looking far into the future at what might be possible if we can create technology that greatly exceeds the current biological capacity. But as a neuroscientist, I can tell you with even more certainty that our ability to replicate even simple functions of the brain with current technology is greatly limited, right? So, you know, Right now, we'll be very happy if we can restore our wounded warfighters to a, a whole state where we can re restore their missing limb function or even augment their damaged brain function, but that would be success in our lifetime. Thinking beyond that at how we might enhance those abilities you know, is certainly inspirational and it's going to drive a lot of the science that we do, but it's, all, it's always going to be for the purpose of sort of improving the human condition not necessarily creating some uh, something you know some greater concern. I'm very disappointed. 
<laughs> because I've always dreamt of having two opposable thumbs on each hand because you could tie your shoelaces with one hand. I mean, think about the things you could do with the extra opposable thumb. And I really, I'm very, I truly am asking you, is there anything wrong with that? If you had to replace my hand, is there anything wrong with it? Or tell me what you would want to have enhanced. Give me some ideas about the crazy things you want, and then let somebody else tell you why it's not a good idea. We had a comment right up here in the front first, and then we'll, we'll move around. Oh, let's wait for the mic, please. Thanks. Linda Griffith, MIT. One could argue that there's varying degrees of enhancement that already go on in all incremental no, no. ways. And this is another step when a new technology comes along, whether it's eyeglasses or anything else, you have these incremental advances. And one might reason that giving, you know, doing things that might enhance one function, everyone would want it, but maybe not everyone would want it. Because even ability to do math fantastically well isn't always coming with other traits that help you survive and be happy and functional and contribute to society. So I, I guess a question is, when you have an enhancement, I, I don't have a problem with my shoes because I wear Velcro shoes and or slip-ons, so I may not want opposable thumbs, but I may want something else because the constellation of all the things I am, which are not one, one you know, brain circuit or right. three brain circuits, but an interacting, set that still seems fairly far away would make me want this or that or the other and there wouldn't be just one thing. So I think these incremental enhancements aimed at improving the lives of our servicemen, first and foremost since we're here at DARPA, bleed over into things that are incrementally the way they've always done. That would be my view. Well, so clearly we've got the possibility not of just one kind of enhancement for everybody, but myriad different enhancements making all of us somewhat different from one another in ways we haven't explored. So. It does, Linda brings up a really good point, and that is the point of choice. So this is uh, giving us an opportunity um, all the time. I want, I'm curious what your opinion on this is, is that this idea of choice, that you, you, you can choose to have this enhancement. The, the issue, of, of course, would be is availability. If, if, if the availability is for all, and thereby everyone could choose, such as like spectacles. Spectacles are inexpensive enough that not only the rich are going to have it, not only the, the politically connected are going to have it, but everybody could have it. But similarly, if we have these capabilities and it's available to all and allows a, an opportunity for choice, individual choice, what does that do to the discussion? Well, I know we've got some other comments, so I'll, I'll just say one thing. We've got one here, we've got two back there, one here. Um, Every time there's a new technological innovation, when I go to an ethics meeting, one of the questions that's raised is the distributive justice issue because of unequal access and whether that's such a problem that we should avoid the technology or if we should simply try to correct the problem. I guess my question is the flip side of this, which is we're very happy mandating vaccines for the entire population. You know, Trotsky said you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. You may not be in, interested in improvements, but improvements may be interested in you, uh, and that may be politically imposed or it might be competitively imposed because you can no longer get a job if you don't have capability X, Y, or Z. So there's a lot variety of ways in which the technology comes to you. Interesting. So that the very existence of it can be coercive by virtue Absolutely. of the range of people who are taking it and uh, showing its advantages. Uh, we had some people way in the back who had their hands up first. I'm sorry. I know there's a lot of people to go. Hi, so I was thinking about the, well, the clip where it said the firewall. Um, it seems like, I mean, my just naive interpretation of that is people have shown gr really great capacity for good and evil in history, and the firewall is basically a firewall against the, the, I guess, the worst of human nature to try to prevent that from happening. For any technology, I'm sure everyone could appreciate, there are dual sides. There are good applications, there are essentially um, very bad applications and so on. So the rule, as blunt as it is, is to try to prevent that and maybe focus on good application that benefits everyone. So that's just the thought that I have. Same dilemma as this morning. Everybody wanted to know how to stop the bad actors. Uh, which one? Okay, way in the back in the corner, I think, was a hand up, and then we'll move to the other side of the room. Sorry. Okay. I have a question that deals with ethics and so forth. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Murray Cooper. And I'm with Honeywell. I have a question that deals with ethics and morals and so forth. Uh, we were uh, interacting with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they were looking at uh, uh, the possibility of evaluating DNA from, from, from newborns. 
and to be determined that this individual might be a future psychopath, sociopath, a future Hitler, things like that. That's reality. What do you do in that case? You take the child from the mother and, and hide him or destroy him or put him on a leper colony? What do you do in those kinds of situations if technology goes so far as to say, hey, 30 years from now, this guy's another Boston Strangler, and there is much evidence they could predict that. Right. So the, the moral issue and so forth, I think, is quite interesting to hear your comments. Well, because I want to give other people time, I suspect that the first reaction wouldn't be to isolate the kid, it would be to try to cure the kid, right? That's what they tried to do with poor Julian Bashir. Um, but we can go back to that later when there's more time. Uh, let's see. Uh, over here in the tie with the little, I can't tell what those are. It's a blue tie. <clears throat> Thank you. Mike Guillaume, Strategic Studies Quarterly. About a, f a few months ago, I read an article, and this article was about the research the Chinese are doing to enhance intelligence. Some of you may have seen the same one. And their goal was, in the next 10 years, we will, have, we will be able to create children with an intelligence uh, quotient 20% greater than, than we have today. So I'd like to hear your views on the national security implications for that. I can think of several. And uh, thanks for bringing up the, uh, the societal inequality issue of if we decided to do that in the U.S. So, comment? Um, again, because we want lots of people to talk, this, these things go on for hours, these conversations. But let me just throw back a question to you we can think about later. Is there any difference between doing that genetically or doing that environmentally, nutritionally, and physically, the way we already do create vast inequalities between people and their capacities, depending upon their early, earliest years, even their in utero environment? So we have exactly this problem. The question is, why do we treat it differently when it's genetics, right? Uh, let's see. There was a gentleman in a green shirt and a jacket there. David Arnold, University of Florida. So the counterpoint or maybe a different point of view is, for example, in sports, um, it's accepted that you can work out, pump iron, get stronger, faster, whatever, but then if it comes to chemical enhancement with steroids or other performance enhancing things, it's strictly forbidden in sports leagues, professional athletes and such, but I was learning at lunch that for our fighter pilots and other things, there's, there's areas where we give performance enhancement through chemical means. So there's these very gray areas of where a pair of prescription glasses with bifocal capabilities is completely acceptable, uh, but certain things are, are sort of taboo for different reasons. I'm just curious if there's sort of underlying cultural reasons that these different it, things get categorized. I wish I knew. You can, have an can idea? I make, can I make a comment on that? You may recall that when Oscar Pistorius was considering an Olympics run, there was considerable debate in the, in the, in the uh, athletic community as to whether or not he should be allowed to compete because he has advanced, uh, uh, enhanced legs. The guy doesn't have legs, right? They're prostheses. And they didn't, there were many in the community that didn't think he should be able to compete because he had an unfair advantage. It's up to you to decide if that's really an unfair advantage. Even in sports, it's kind of an unclear set of rules because in some sports we imagine that we have to accommodate multiple levels of capacity in order to have a level playing field. So we've got the featherweights and the middleweights and the heavyweights in boxing. But when it comes to basketball, absolutely nobody has made a league for short people like me, right? <laughs> so only people who are naturally category A are allowed to play basketball. And so we have not yet completely figured out what it is we're testing in sports. Is it capacity? Is it training? Is it discipline? Uh, until we figure that out, we never know exactly how we want to resolve these things. But it goes, I think, very much to the question earlier about justice and the distribution of these enhancements. Uh, in the front row over here. Jeff Kugelman, you Uh The question I have relates to uh, if I, I agree that we're not, we're, you know, fixing problems, broken things is, is where we need to get to first. But when we do go beyond that, um, if we start removing selective pressures on the population, are we then uh, setting ourselves up for some kind of catastrophic fall due to something else that we would have evolved to meet? Um, I may turn to some of my colleagues here to talk about population genetics and evolutionary theory, and whether Justin, or not you think we you can wanna, intervene that much. Take yeah. that one, Justin. I think that there's always a balance, right? Um, uh, we, we really have to take a look at how um, we utilize these capabilities, right? Do they help our species to evolve? 
Uh, do they impair our species to evolve? And just be very upfront about that and, and, and take a very close look at it. Um, you know, I think time will tell as we get into these spaces, as we learn more about these spaces, uh, ultimately how they'll make an impact on our society as a whole. Uh, there's somebody right here in the front as well. Yeah, Matt Schultz from Immisoft. Um, we've been working on a project that I want to get your input on. It's an open source in vivo electroprator. And basically what it lets you do is gene therapy in your garage. And uh, as a, a kind of clinical application for uh, more practical use, we've been working on overexpressing folostatin, a naturally occurring myostatin inhibitor that increases muscle mass. But a device like this would drastically shift the balance of power out of the large academic and government groups into the individual, where you quite literally could type a gene sequence into a web browser, it arrives in the mail, and now you can upload it to your body. And uh, this is, I, mean, I have it sitting on my kitchen table, like it's, it's something that's functioning today. Um, but turning it loose on the world seems like it could have pretty drastic uh, consequences. And I want to get your take on it. Um. I'm going to answer that partly with respect to something else because um, there's a difference between being able to control science that takes place in very highly centralized and identifiable locations and science that takes place in a decentralized fashion. And we see that in environmental law where it's much easier to regulate, for example, what we call point source pollution. There's a factory. It has an effluent. You can tell them what level they're allowed to put out in the river or not. Much harder to deal with runoff from 10 million different suburban lawns. Which is, a, which is a decentralized problem, takes totally different regulatory systems. And I think that science is moving in that direction. We are decentralizing and democratizing science, and it's going to require a different kind of regulatory system than the one that we're used to having. I don't have the answer yet, but at least I think we are beginning to glimpse the problem. Uh, there's a woman in black and white stripes. Hi, I'm Shelley Cazares, uh, formerly from Boston Scientific, now the Institute for Defense Analyses. And um, my question has to do with the fact that one man's disability is another man's gift. Uh, we see that in the deaf community where um, many people in the deaf community are against cochlear implants. Other people are for cochlear implants. Um, you also see it with synesthesia, uh, seeing sounds or tasting colors. There are some people who think that, well, that would be crazy. But then there are those of us who have types of synesthesia who can't imagine living our lives without that. Um, so going back to the concept of choice, where each individual huh. would have to make a choice as to whether to view their condition as a disability or a gift. Um, but how does society at large place value judgments on whether a particular condition is positive or negative, and, and where do those assumptions come from? Do you see this in your practice, Jeff? Well, I think that you raise a really good point, several really good points. But I would say that it, you know, it still comes back to what I said to you before is choice, right? And um, since the uh, previous speaker talked about democratization of science, in essence, it's now relegating down many of these choices to the individual level. Right? If you can do it yourself in your garage with his device, then honestly, it doesn't matter what society thinks. You're going to do it yourself in your garage. The, and a lot of that, uh, what would prevent you from doing something and, or uh, let you do something is actually your own code of ethics, which probably does have a lot where society will have an impact on you, is what is considered to be the social norm, the social ethics uh, uh, of the day, of the time, of the place. But really, it still comes back to choice, does it not? Um, you know, for all of these things, uh, we're actually getting to the point in our society that things that we would have thought long ago would not be a discussion point for choice, such as gender, such as race, now such as physical enhancements and the like, now suddenly become part of the discussion. And so that, I think that's where we are right now, isn't it? Uh, we know that capabilities are coming, but I think that what's really important now is to actually have this discussion, because if we have this discussion, we can move forward as a society and as individuals to be informed. I would also just add one very brief thing. I think that the deaf community and uh, the community of little people, midgets and dwarfs, those two communities are rather unusual in the degree to which they've managed to see what we would ordinarily view as a disability if we were born with more typical characteristics and view it as a kind of um, tribal identity almost, and to live within a world in which everything is designed to fit, right? You live in a community of deaf people and your doorbells always flash lights, and if you are in a community of little people, your furniture and your homes are adapted to that size. 
But I think it's unusual to have things that we call disabilities create communities like that. So I think the problem is real, but I don't think it'll pop up quite as often as we might imagine. For those communities, though, it's a very real issue with that personal choice, yes. Uh, let's begin to alternate again. So we got way in the back and then on the side. Lucianne Walkwich, Adler Planetarium. So one of the things that I like thinking about is the ethics of terraforming other planets, other worlds like Mars, for example. So you could think about, instead of doing that in the sort of the far afield uh, view, of um, altering human beings to live in less habitable environments, or at least to be able to survive, if, if not thrive. So you could imagine making people more possibly able to live on Mars um, in the current environment that it has. But then you could also imagine bringing that back to an earthly focus where one of the things we're currently doing is making the Earth less habitable. So then you would have people who were essentially able to live um, in a less habitable, by our current definition, Earth, which would bring up, I think, two, two questions. Number one, again, it's the unequal access question of people who can live in a less habitable Earth and who can't. And then also, what would our roles be as stewards of the environment if we as a species could survive in a, a place where many other species could not? I'd like to take a shot Please. at this. So just kind of connecting your comment back with what Jeff said here, you know, when we think about the evolution of our species, right, and the challenges that our species is uh, going to be facing, you know, we often think about how is neurotechnology, like we're talking about today, going to facilitate that, right? How, again, in the positive sense, those technologies may help us to deal with these situations that you're, you're talking about, right? And um, I think that right now we're just starting to open the door to that space. And I think that conversations like this help us, again, to be very informed about what the great potential is uh, for, for moving in that positive direction. So it's, it's really exciting, right? Two things also. First, this actually has already been a discussion in a much less high-tech uh, context. Um, uh, Johnson Controls is a factory near Milwaukee in my a new adopted state of Wisconsin. And they manufacture batteries, which involve some aspects of the factory having a lot of lead exposures. And so their solution was to simply exclude women of reproductive age entirely from that area of the factory to their detriment because it was a necessary step for promotion to other kinds of positions. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court on the question of whether or not we should be forced to adapt workplaces to all people or whether we can essentially force people to adapt to the workplace. Who should bear the cost of this kind of adaptation? And so it's still a very lively debate, although in that case the answer was we adapt to all people. Uh, the second is, I hope you've read Brave New World, because what you're describing in terms of the alteration of people is the alpha and the beta and the gamma and the delta kind of kids that were being born. Remember the ones that were uh, in the test tubes upside down so that they could become astronauts and wouldn't worry about being upside down in space, right? Uh, so that's going to be the popular culture image that's going to come to mind when somebody like you talks about this in a more serious way, right? Uh, we had somebody over here on the side, right? Great discussion. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Percy Singleton, um, cyberspace, cyberspace Support Squadron, Scott Air Force Base. And my question is that um, I really commend you all for working with the military. I'm retired military myself, working with military on the, the, uh, the uh, endeavor that you're starting. But have you also looked at the vast numbers of people with mental health problems in the United States? Because it seems to me that that's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's astronomical. When I was growing up, we had mental health areas where people would, but mental health would go until they at least got well. Now it seems like when your insurance money runs out, you're out on the street. So um, that's one area that I think that I would try to take care of. I thank you for that uh, segue. Um, we, 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 we planted him, obviously, uh, for our second example. <laughs> so uh, we, we spoke of enhancement. Uh, that gave us uh, sensory capabilities, perhaps, some physical capabilities. But enhancement may be different if we're discussing psychological or perhaps cognitive capabilities. Uh, the Julian Bashir uh, uh, episode that we saw was that you know, they were afraid that he was not uh, cognitively uh, capable of, uh, of performing at a certain level. They manipulated genetics, and he performed at an even higher level. Uh, we all know that parents right now struggle daily 
on this issue of performance, academic performance in school. They're less uh, concerned about athletic performance, but they're very concerned about academic performance. Everybody wants to have the kid that is an AP everything and getting straight A's. Is this, in fact, possible? And what does it mean? And, and, and more to the point, how can we use it in a beneficent sense in those patients who may have suffered traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder? Are these areas that DARPA is now uh, looking into? And it really means really now exploring the other part of the nervous system, which is, in fact, the brain. And, um, and I have, I'm going to tell you right now that we at DARPA do not view this at all as science fiction. We deal it as reality. And the person who is spearheading this effort is uh, our very own Dr. Justin Sanchez. Thanks so much, Jeff. And thanks for your fantastic question. So we're going to shift the conversation a little bit here and, and talk about the higher level functions of the brain, right? So cognition and learning and memory, OK? Now, before we get into the details of all of that, all of you have been to our, our demo booth you know, downstairs, and you have seen direct interfaces to the brain are a reality, OK? They exist today. I mean, you firsthand saw what we're developing. Now, uh, let me walk you through some of the concepts that are associated with how we think about neuropsychiatric illness, higher level function of the brain, and the new kinds of neurotechnologies or interfaces that we're developing, okay? So, you know, we start a lot of these concepts and discussions around the injured warfighter, right? So, again, somebody presents to the clinic with, let's say, a PTSD or a traumatic brain injury, and we ask the question, what is the best a clinician can give to these individuals, right? And it may be uh, pharmacotherapy, it may be behavioral therapy, it may be, you know, talk, talk to your psychiatrist, right? And we view those as, you know, they do have an effect, but they may not have the level of precision that um, we feel that we need to really uh, make a huge impact in the functional aspects of, of what the brain is doing in, in these kinds of, of indications, right? So the technologies that we're developing, we often view as being new windows into the brain, right? So um, let's say the, the electronics you saw downstairs, they can interface with individual neurons, we can um, uh, sense what those neurons are doing. We have engineers and computational scientists building algorithms that can interpret what those neurons are doing, and they can inform or help to guide uh, clinicians or physicians uh, to deliver targeted therapies to the specific and precise neurons of the brain that are involved in those kinds of disorders, okay? So we think of this as being transformative on how we deliver uh, clinical therapies for the future. And we want to give new options, you know, getting back to that point that we've been talking about, choices, new options and choices for people that have intractable kinds of disorders, all right? So let me give you some specific examples of where we're actually making huge leaps in these spaces, all right? And the first program I'd like to tell you about is the Restoring Active Memory Program, okay? So, and the nickname for this is, is RAM. So today, you know, one year into uh, the, the program, we have human subjects that are using some of the technologies that we are developing, again, to directly interface with those neurons of the brain. Um, we can study declarative memories, okay, about, we, we can look at how the brain uh, forms and recalls memories about facts. We can sense from the brain when a person is going to correctly or incorrectly uh, recall an, an aspect of a fact, and we can intervene via direct stimulation to the brain in order to facilitate memory formation and recall, okay? So this isn't science fiction anymore. You know, we are in that uh, restorative kind of domain, you know, at this very uh, moment in time. And again, we have to start thinking about, you know, the implications of this, right? I, you know, I, I know all of us here can struggle with memory throughout our day, and I know all of us, you know, if we just had a 10% or 20% boost in, in memory, it would be transformative, you know, for our lives. So again, this discussion and this work that we're doing is not just uh, having an impact for people that, you know, ha have a, 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 an injury or disability, but it also, again, affects the broader aspects of society. Um, a second example that I would like to, to give you is, is directly in the neuropsychiatric domain. Again, we have teams of individuals that are developing technologies that can go to the many different subnetworks of the brain, can record what those neurons are doing with respect to things like anxiety and depression and PTSD. 
interpret that, that activity, and again, deliver the targeted stimulation or feedback to the brain in order to help deal with uh, some of those very complex issues. And again, a specific uh, example, we have teams uh, in the country that are looking at, let's say, anxiety. We have human subjects right now that you know, have extreme anxiety. We have neural interfaces to their brain and can stimulate their, their brains and see a reduction in the level of anxiety that, that they have, okay? So again, these are the realities of, of the things that we're doing. Now, with all of this being said, an important aspect to also remember and kind of consider with how DARPA does its work, from the very onset of when we think about these problems, we engage with leading experts in the ethical, legal, and social implications of what we're doing. And we ask for information about how they view the kinds of work that we do, all right? And this really comes in to inform the program managers, to inform the office, to kind of you know, uh, help us to think about all of the broad aspects of, of the technologies that we are developing. So you know, at every step along the way, we're thinking very deeply about this. And you know, why do we do this? Uh, we take it very seriously that at DARPA, it's our job and our responsibility to face these very difficult challenges you know, head on and up front. We want to think about them in terms of what it means for the national security of our country. We want to think about uh, what it means for our, our military personnel. We want to think about it, what it means with respect to what other countries are doing and staying very far ahead of, uh, of, of what may ultimately be out there. So, you know, again, we see this as a transformative time. We have technologies that are really um, making a difference in terms of what we think about the brain, and we're opening the door to the possibilities of the future. So um, with that, let's uh, have some more discussion. Wow. Yeah. Well, Alta, there's a Star Trek episode for everything. So what do you got for us? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I said that to him. <laughs> um, well. It's not even going to seem like science fiction after what you just told us about. <laughs> the first clip is from Star Trek Voyager when Captain Janeway is, in, is interacting with an alien species that has telepathic capacities. And you'll get a chance to see what it's like to imagine a kind of implanted memories and the learning that can come along with it. Uh, so why don't we start video clip three? So a rather benign version, although it would have been nicer if she knew what was about to happen to her, uh, a rather benign version of how you could share memories, implant memories, and then apparently immediately have the skill necessary to use those memories for action. Um, but I'd like to introduce another clip that shows a different way of using implanted memories, just so that the conversation takes a broader view of these. Uh, I don't want to tell you too much beforehand. Let me just tell you that this is Miles O'Brien. He is, uh, well, he was on the Star Trek Enterprise, now he's on Deep Space Nine, uh, and he has been convicted on an alien planet of espionage, and so has been punished uh, by that planet. So why don't we start our fourth clip? So Miles O'Brien has the memory of 20 years of what actually in the show you'll see is solitary confinement that actually drives him somewhat crazy. But it didn't really happen, right? Um, Jeff? Well, um, so Justin, what do you, how do you think this plays into the work that you're yeah. supporting? So, so we got to think deeply about this, right? <laughs> so, so let's take the clips one by one. So if we uh, go back to you know, the first clip, Jane Way and, and learning how to play an instrument, you know, that really brings up issues of, of autonomy, right? Um, you know, that uh, memory or, or that skill of, of using that instrument, that was given to her, you know, again, kind of against her will, right? She didn't have the autonomy. Uh, so it's one of the things that we take very seriously at DARPA, right? Anybody that participates in the kinds of uh, you know, work that we're doing, there's a, you know, informed consent, there's all of these different layers that help us to preserve the autonomy that, that goes uh, along uh, with that, right? Um, and again, it's something that um, we take very seriously. The second clip is more about um, perception, right? Between what is real and what is not real and how our brain uh, processes perceptions. And you know, without a doubt, with the kinds of technologies that um, we're developing and others are developing, you know, the definition of what perception really is, how we process it, uh, how we respond to that perception, you know, there, there's a lot of unknowns there, right? So while there is the realities of what's uh, happening now and while there's the science fiction of what you just saw, you know, again, it, it raises a lot of very interesting kinds of questions in these very fundamental spaces that we just talked about here. You know, when I watch these things, and unfortunately I watch Star Trek way too often, um, 
I, I find myself beginning to wonder about things. So uh, with Janeway, I wonder whether or not the learning is authentic if it wasn't based on the actual experience. But the memory is all I have of any of the training I've ever had, and that's what I'm drawing on. So why should it be any less authentic? Um, but I still try to kind of wind up going around in circles. And the O'Brien one is the one that actually I find the most perturbing in trying to figure it out, because it, it is explained by the aliens as a more merciful kind of thing to do. It's more efficient. You don't have to have an, a prison system. And frankly, O'Brien doesn't actually lose 20 years of his life. He has 20 years of memories of being in prison, but he can now go back and start his life once he gets done with his counseling and get those 20 years, right? But on the other hand, it seems like some really appalling invasion of his, of his personal integrity, of his personal sense of self. And I can't tell whether I think this is a great idea or one of the worst ideas I've ever heard of. So I wanted to actually start by throwing it out to you and get some of your reactions to these clips, because I think they're thought provoking about where we might go when it comes to implanting memories. Uh, how about uh, in the back in the, is that a white shirt and a tie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My eyesight needs an implant very badly. I, I'm going to bring up a touchy point, and I'm uh, debating if I should bring it up, but I've been with uh, Colonel Wing in meetings, and he's not shy, so I'm not going to be shy, okay? <laughs> and this, I want to preface it by saying this is no reflection on DARPA, believe me. But let's look at history. The gentleman talked about doing things that are good for the government, good for the military. My ancestors ancestors were Holocaust victims and Holocaust survivors. 1940, Dr. <laughs> thank God Dr. Benenji is not on the panel, but some of the same points that you brought up today, the Nazis brought up in 1940, okay? You read Nietzsche, the Superman, okay? The Aryan soldier, uh, racial cleansing, all that stuff. There's a connection, you know? And it sort of scared me, I'll be honest with you. To hear some of the things, and again, I'm not reflecting that DARPA's any connection at all to, to, to Nazi Germany or anything like that, but that was reality, and they talked almost the same things. How do you, you know, it's not a question. It's a point to think about. Absolutely. Uh, how about we switch sides back and forth? So we've got somebody here in the front row. So I think the implanting memories uh, experiment has been done by Beth Loftus. Um, as I recall, the experiment had to do with um, telling children about the time that they were lost in the supermarket. And this was an implanted memory, and then she would go back and ask the kid about the time that she was lost in the supermarket some years later. And, and you know, the, the result was that the kids all believed they had been lost in the supermarket, even though it was an implanted memory. I'm amazed that that got through any kind of IRB. I mean, even I, though it's something utterly benign, you know, just messing with a, a kid's mind to that degree seems, um, again, I'm surprised to go through an IRB. But the question is why? Uh, the kinds of messing with people's bodies that we were talking about in the first part of the session were much more extreme than implanting memory about being stuck in a supermarket. But we have a much stronger reaction to that. Hmm. And I think that the reason is probably, I think it was Dan Dennett who said, you know, um, your, your brain is the part you want to take with you Right? The, the, when, when it comes time to swap the parts out, you want to keep the brain, right? <laughs> because I think that that's really where we think we are. Right? And, and that there's a sense in which you mess with my brain, you mess with me in a fundamental way. What's interesting about this is the entire discussion is about similarity and difference, change and, and standard. In the first part, we were talking about deviations from a norm that were either random, that is mutations, or were induced, but were, were sort of deviations from some norm. And we said, look, induced deviations, not so good. Random deviations, that's fine. I, I think it seems to be even more so with respect to memories. Huh. You know, you mess with my memories. You've just changed me completely. 
I'm no longer me. I'm a different person if you mess with my memories. In well, a way that I'm not a different person if you cut off my arm and you replace it with a different arm. Justin, yeah. any reactions? Yeah, today? absolutely. So, you know, um, connecting back to that um, comment I made about the ethical, legal, and social implications and, and really getting feedback, this is something that came up very early, is the sense of self, right? And how it's a, it's a, it's a central part of who we are as humans and how we try to protect our sense of, of self and uh, think very deeply about how our experiences, whether they're through a neural interface or through just life, you know, how that changes our sense of self. Uh, we think very deeply, again, about how these kind of volitional technolog uh, technological um, uh, techniques, right, are different than, let's say, what you would um, have in school, right? So when you go to school and you learn some things, you're changing your sense of self, you're changing your memories, right? It's not necessarily through technology, but it's through a, a structured process that, as society as a whole, we have put into play in order to change who we are, right? So again, we're trying to really look at that balance and, and find out where on the spectrum of things that are possible, you know, really where we should be working. We have a person over here and then uh, another person way in the back for the next one. I'm Brent Darg with the Boeing Research and Technology. And I, re I research uh, learning and education. And so, so in, implanting our, our uh, changing behaviors of, of someone, you know, making them from a novice into an expert is, is very intriguing and could improve safety and such. So we're looking at, at, at ways to do that and make it faster, cheaper, better type of thing. Um, the, the comment I really wanted to make, I think, is, is I, what, I, I think steroids is, is an example that provides maybe a case law example that it can, it can help, but it, the ethical problem is how somebody um, behaves or uh, uses the, the, um, the implementation or the enhancement. So if I have teeth, or I have, uh, you know, the, um, uh, crowns on my teeth, they're probably better than the, my normal teeth, um, and nobody has any questions about that. But if, I, but if I use them to break the law, then maybe that would be the, the problem. So I think it's, it's how people actually take advantage of it that's the problem. It's not the enhancement itself. And then also uh, about the cognitive enhancements, I have heard that, that some kids are at a disadvantage if they don't take Ritalin, even if they don't have ADD, because this cognitive enhancement drug is now being abused by people, and now the people who aren't abusing it are, are at a disadvantage. So that, that kind of blurs the, the ethical line there. Um, in the corner. Um, I'm uh, Adrian Prada at uh, University of California, Irvine. I have two comments on, on the memory question. Um, so first, I think I have a bias. I'm a psychiatrist. so. Um, there is something to be said about good versus bad memories. And actually, we do have the pharma pharma pharmacological ability to enhance or weaken memories at this point. The problem that we need to think about is what makes for a good or a bad memory, because it turns out that even trauma could actually improve resilience under okay. certain conditions. And we do not we are not able at this point to know prospectively if a bad memory will stay bad or will actually result in further growth uh, from a resilience perspective. That's one of the comments that I have on positive versus negative memories. The second comment I have is about memory as a function because there is something to be said about the ability to remember but also to forget. Oh. And, and uh, there is a role for forgetting that act that's actually very, very healthy. Um, if you are to look at the literature, literature, actually, people with photographical memories don't take that as a blessing most times. That's a curse in disguise. Those are my two comments. You know, I, I do want to say something in response to that because, because of reasons of time, uh, we weren't able to show the myriad clips I wanted to show. And one of them is really on point because there's another episode in which uh, the crew of Star Trek Voyager suddenly begins experiencing memories of uh, particularly horrific combat on a particular planet where there were real war crimes that were being committed. And, and they experienced them as absolutely real. 
and it's, it's appalling and they're horrified and they feel like they've been tortured for no reason until they suddenly realize that this is actually a memorial. This has been set up to tell people about what happened and teach them about how to make it not happen again. And it made me reflect on all the memorials around Washington, D.C., and the effect it might have if instead of just looking at a wall with names, you actually had a flash of what it was like to be there, right? So your point about the kind of blessing and curse simultaneously of some experiences is really on point and, uh, and one that needs to be thought about carefully before we do anything that either enhances or decreases the memory of anything. Uh, let's see, uh, the gentleman in the short sleeves. Um, Frank Lee from Drexel University, a game design professor. So I'll throw another food for thought. There's a recent video game called Remember Me where the whole premise is you hack the memory to affect behavior so that you might ha hack the memory of a person to have that person commit suicide uh, by making them despondent. All their uh, the immediate um, you know, children, wife are dead and so on or do other stuff. So there is a potential, because thought is very closely related to action, by affecting and altering or modifying memory, you could actually alter the person's behavior, not just within themselves, but against other people, other society. So I think that's another important danger that's not reflected on the videos, but maybe on the videos that you haven't shown. Um, any reactions? Doug, how about you? You're going to take it from a different viewpoint. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, as we've already discussed, a lot of the technology that we're pursuing, we're pursuing for noble purposes, right? And how it's ultimately used is often beyond our control. But so long as the end user maintains that ability to choose, then no matter what we, you know, no matter what we do, if they choose to use or not use the technology we create, I think you know, will it be then successful. But it is beginning to make me think about the difference in the kinds of memories we might be talking about. So watching Janeway learn how to play an instrument made me think about the many, many years I've spent trying to perfect my French and Spanish and how much I would really value having somebody simply implant many more years of study than I've actually put in so that my subjunctive <laughs> would finally be correct in both languages. Um, you know, that seems more benign than some of the other kinds of things that we've been talking about. And so it may be that there's a need to be more nuanced on the kinds of experiences and memories we're talking about enhancing or decreasing uh, and our confidence in the kind of effect it might have. Right. Just kind of building upon your comment, you know, another thing that we found, you know, kind of going through these ethical, legal, and social implications um, is that, you know, the earning of an ability or a, a skill, right? This is another kind of core concept for our society that, again, Jane Way was kind of just bestowed this. She didn't necessarily have to earn it or have to work for it. And, um, you know, again, there, there's some real interesting yeah, questions true. there about how that plays into technology versus going through the 10,000 hours it may take in order to uh, learn one of these skills or have these kinds of memories, right? Uh, why don't we keep with anybody who's not had a chance to speak yet, yes? Yeah, yeah, sorry, and the glasses and the jacket, sorry. Uh, Charles Frack, yeah, I'm between MIT and Harvard Medical School. Uh, it seems, just a comment, uh, it seems to me that there are two questions. There's a question of integrity and how does the legal framework kind of follow that? Are we gonna have, um, if the brain is the core um, source of humanity, then are we gonna have to update uh, the habeas corpus, for example? Right, uh, how, um, how are the rules gonna evolve around that? That's one question. Um, how do you see also integrity playing into this? I, I think there was a, 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 sorry, intention playing into this. Um, I think this is a, a great point. Um, the cyberpunk movement is known for, for example, legalizing the ability to uh, have the knowledge around cryptography, but the intention to use cryptography in certain ways can be you know, unlawful. So, so the notion of intent, I think, is also key in this. Anybody else? Because we're running out of time, so maybe we, instead of answering, we should actually let the last one or two. Yeah, maybe the last person. Yeah. Okay. So I have an observation that leads to a question, um, and that observation is. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Jack Newman. I'm with Strategic Analysis. Contractor for DARPA. Uh, the observation is, as we become more and more adept, as we have more and more power through technology, it seems that we are constantly faced with the question of how we use that that power. Um, 
And uh, as we've all noted, we can use it for good things or we can use it for bad things. But we have to approach questions that we never had to approach before. So for example, if we know that a genetic disease is caused by a particular uh, genetic lesion and we can correct that, if we correct it, we take responsibility for the outcome. Whereas if we didn't, we don't have to take any responsibility. The interesting observation is as we have developed more and more technological capability, it seems to me, and people could take issue with this, that we've also developed more wisdom in how we use that. And you can go back and look to the Holocaust 50 years ago, to um, human rights 100 years ago, or in biblical times, and that's the trend that I see. So the question I have is, do you see any interplay between the development of technology and the development of our wisdom as a species to use that technology? <laughs> Thank you, Jack. <laughs> I'm an optimist, so I'll say yes. <laughs> Seriously, um, uh, I don't think anybody can really answer that because nobody knows how to measure wisdom, let alone measure the technology. Um, so really, it is only an aspiration. Um, well, we've come to the end. I, I really want to thank you all because you have actually made this session to be very interesting and exciting and thought-provoking. But I want to leave you with this, that Star Trek wonderful as it is, it's still fantasy. We at DARPA, seriously, are creating the nuke's reality. So I want to thank you all for joining us.